Moreland. I'm your current president for West Hawaii Association. And today we'd like to welcome Joe, Joe Kent. And he grew up on the Big Island and attended the University of Hawaii at Hilo and Minnesota State Universities, where he obtained his degree in education. Kent was a public school teacher for eight years at King Kamehameha III School in Lahaina, Maui, and Sleepy Eye Public School in Minnesota. He's also a former student uh, fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education. He's here today representing Grassroots Institute, and we welcome him with all our aloha. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for inviting me here today. Um, uh, yes, I am from the Big Island. Uh, I grew up in Tonanu, and my dad was committed to at a church, um, United Church of Christ, on the Hamakua Coast. Um, his name is Ron Kent. And uh, he still lives here. He lives uh, in Paradise Park. But um, I'm really glad to be here because I'm just passionate about understanding more about the Big Island issues. The Grassroots Institute, if you haven't heard of us, we're a 501c3 nonprofit think tank that focuses on individual liberty, economic freedom, and accountable government. And those three things are in short supply here in Hawaii, we know that, um, but it's a different point of view and we have a um, motto that we like to say, a Hanukkah Ko, which means let's work together. So we try to work together with all groups, uh, doesn't matter which political stripes or economic stripes you are, uh, we wanna learn from you and, and learn where we're wrong and let's talk and discuss in a Hanukkah Ko. Um, could you move to the next slide? Yes. Um, oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> so who are we? Um, this is our staff. Um, Kenny Akina, he is the president and CEO of the Grassroots Institute. He's also a trustee for the Office of Hawaii Affairs. Um, and this is our wonderful, lovely staff here. Um, we've got a government affairs team that goes to the legislature and county councils. Uh, we have a policy team, communication staff. We're on TikTok. We're on YouTube. We've got an email list of 30,000 people that read our stuff every week. And so if you're not on our email, uh, please consider joining or signing up for free at grassrootinstitute.org. And uh, a special aloha to all those uh, online. I hope you can see me. It looks like I'm talking to Cal from a 2001 Space Office. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, hello. And um, today I want to talk a little bit, if you go back to the first slide, about short-term rentals and about the real cause of Hawaii's housing crisis. I also want to talk a little bit about um, the sector issue as well. So, um, so let's start with short-term rentals. So let's go to the next one. Yeah, there we go. And the next one. So these are the short-term rentals on White Island. Um, well, when you look at it look like that, it looks kind of uh, uh, alarming. But actually, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see, oh, actually one more. You can see that these short-term rentals only make up about 8% of these housing supply, the housing units on the Big Island. And so um, it's actually just a fraction of the supply that we're talking about under long context. Uh oh. Ooh. It's oh, yeah. okay. Okay. It's <laughs> okay. Can you go back again? And so the short term rentals that we're talking about include luxury. Oh, let's see here. That's where it went left. Oh, okay. Ooh. Well, I can just continue here. <laughs> um, Short-term rentals include luxury estates, and we've got. Um, ooh. Well, I'm going to figure this out, otherwise I'll be a little distracted. That power spit not on. Oh, no, it's on because the L is on. on. Yeah, like that's what happened Monday. Yeah, it's just like yeah, connection was an angle. Either. Don't try the other. 
So those short-term rentals were both hosted and not hosted, or was that not hosted? Maybe? Okay, so those were uh, both hosted and not hosted. Okay, exactly. all of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about, what, 7,800 short-term rentals? Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's rewind. That's right. illegal ones are? Yeah, that's hard to find out, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, back one more. So um, on the west side, you've got some some short term rentals includes timeshares um, that are that we see on Airbnb. Um, some include luxury estates. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, some we've got cute little um, um, abodes on the east side, and you've got bed and breakfast. Some some the volcano and so on. So um, there's a lot of different types of short term rentals. Um, you can go to the next slide. We'll, Joe, are you yeah. counting um, special use permitted B&Bs in that yes, count? Yes, okay. uh, including those. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and one more. Good. So this chart shows, um, according to AirDNA, which tracks all of the Airbnb and VRBO and uh, short-term rental purchases, how much revenues were brought into Hawaii Island last year which was about $353 million to the big island economy. It's a huge chunk of change. Um, keep in mind, this isn't, ta this isn't tax revenue, this is private revenue. Um, and that's a big jump from you know, before during the pandemic. Um, I tried to find the number of tax revenues that the big island gets, but it's very difficult to find. I always call Hawaii Island, the least transparent county. I mean, we look, we do transparency requests across the state, um, and it's really difficult to get info on the Big Island. Um, not like on Maui, which is, I think, the most transparent county. They've got a whole uh, chart and report of every tax and where it comes from and the sectors and industries that it comes from. The Big Island has one line item in the budget that just sees <laughs> you know, property taxes or something. And so it's really difficult to find, but I would peg it at around 100 million that the county government gets uh, just based on you know, comparing against other counties. Um, so you can move to the next slide there. Can you get it from TAT numbers? Um, somewhat, somewhat, but even that, <laughs> yeah, even that is difficult. I'm at the county level. Um, but I mean, if you're yeah. thinking GET plus TAT, that's almost 18%. And then there's the property tax differential for people who have the home exemption but lose part of it because of this. So I would imagine somewhere around 25% of that, maybe. It's kind of roughly and where you're county at. county tax as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the GET and the yeah. TAT, yeah. including the county surcharge. Yeah, yeah right. it's around 18 Well, a little more than that now. Yeah. So, so I, and I would... Um, Peg it, you know, you kind of just have to estimate, right? So I would peg it definitely at north of 100 million, especially when you include like the spending that the guests at the short term rentals do. So, um, you know, they they spent 200 million last year, or excuse me, 2019 on, on restaurants and, yes. um, you know, almost 100 million on entertainment. We've got transportation and shopping. So, this is a market that spends a lot on the Big Island and brings huge revenues to the private sector and public sector here. So, where does this data come from? Sorry, I don't want to. Oh, yeah, no, there was, a, no, there was a, a report by Moninger and Sims in um, 2020, I think. Um, I, I can send that to you if you like. So, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Okay. So Hawaii County, as you know, took action to restrict short-term uh, rentals in 2018 with Bill 108. By the way, Hawaii County calls them TAR, um, transient accommodation rental. TAR is like something that you step in. <laughs> November 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get the memo. The other counties call it short-term rentals or something else, but uh, we call it TAR here. At um, anyways, Bill 108 restricts um, short-term rentals if um, if you don't live there. So if it's an unhosted rental, you can't do it unless you're in certain zones, like the resort zones or commercial zones. Um, if you live there, you can do it. So um, that's basically what the deal is right now. They're trying to change the law, or they're trying to change it and update it 
um, with a uh, tome of regulations that are coming down the line that don't have a bill number yet. Um, it's just you know a plan to introduce this, and you can go to the next one. This is what they want to do, which is oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is these are the zones that you can um, operate unhosted short-term rentals in. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so. When we talk about the zones, this is of course in Kailua Kona, and these pink, uh, purple, and uh, brown zones are basically the areas that you can operate on hosted short term rentals in. Um, go to the next slide. And this is where the short term rentals are. Um, so you might think, okay, well, these are all illegal, right? The Mauka side, but actually, uh, a lot of those are posted rentals. People live in their homes. You know, so it's important to keep that in, in our minds because I think a lot, especially in the public or the media, we hear so much about, oh, look at all these illegals and they show a map like this. And they say, look, look at all these illegal short-term rentals. Well, actually, probably most of these aren't illegal. Um, they're probably operating under current law. Um, so that's that. Now, go to the next slide, we can talk about what they want to do. So again, the bill doesn't have uh, a number yet. It has not yet been introduced. They wanted to introduce it um, by now, but I think because they've gotten so much community pushback, they haven't, um, so that might be a good thing. The bill wants no rentals for less than 180 days. And that reminds me a lot of what they tried to do in Honolulu. The same thing, they tried to make a bill that allowed no rentals for less than 180 days. And they did that by changing the definition of short-term rent to less than 180 days. Well, if I rent for 180 days, that's not a short term. That's a long-term stint, right? And so um, it was actually thrown out in the courts um, temporarily. There was an injunction in the first district um, on that Hawaii or Honolulu law. And basically what they did is um, they said that the state has a law called the Zoning Enabling Act, which, uh, which gives, bestows upon the counties the power to zone. But that law says that you can't change the zoning too much so that it would prevent a use that was previously allowed. So um, if you do that, it constitutes a takings. And so, and that's what they argued in court. The judge, said that uh, argument has merit and he issued an injunction. And so that law uh, in Honolulu is stopped, but that portion of the law is stopped and you can rent for a minimum of 30 days in Honolulu. So just a sec here. So um, this is the That's a good lesson for the big island, by the way. Um, because if the um, framers of this bill want to do 180 days, they need to look at that law very closely and you know decide do they want to have a big court battle? Um, do they want to limit that to what 90 days? Um, that still doesn't do an end run around the law. It has to go down to 30, the court says for now. Um, and so that's a big issue. Another one, uh, all short, posted short-term rentals must re uh, register annually. Actually, all short-term rentals would have to register unhosted and hosted um, annually. And there might be requirements for on-site parking. Um, you might have to show that you have proper permits, uh, plumbing or you know, building permits or um, electrical. And you know, on the Big Island, I know there's a lot of old houses that don't have permits or they might have a small structure in the backyard or something that's not permitted. And now you would force all of these folks to go what to the Department of Public Works and try to get a permit, uh, along with everyone else, by the way, which we already have a backlog at, um, on the Big Island for permits, a huge backlog. Um, and so this would make that even worse. You have to notify your neighbors, you got registration fees, you got a $10,000 fine. I don't know how, if, whether or not that fine would be like on a daily basis, by the way. Uh, that's how they do it on the other counties. 
can you imagine a ten thousand dollar fine per day? Um, and we've seen some uh, short term rental owners that rack up like two million dollars in fines and things like that. So, um, you know, like on Mali County or 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 Honolulu. Uh, if that happens, then of course the state may be able to take your property. You know, they uh, lean against it and um, and then take it. So, and they've got laws at the state level not to make it easier for the state to take your property in those cases. So this is a lot of red tape and government regulation that's being, um, you know, it's not being vetted, I think. Well, you've got a requirement for no more than two adults per bedroom, no more than four adults per rental, uh, no commercial wedding or events, and the owner has to live on site. So uh, there's a lot of problems with this. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the whole idea is to get rid of short term. Kind of, yeah. I mean, if the, the first one there tells you what they want to do, really, which is the 180 days, which would basically be a blanket ban on all short term rentals. That's what they you seem to really want to throw to his own dirt. Um, uh, excuse me, not for not for certain properties like vacation, zones, and all that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. It, I had an understanding that they that's one of the reasons they got rid of the S on TAR because it's no longer short term. You're saying all transient. Oh rentals. So I'm just you know Indeed. that's part of the, the name change is get high with happening in Honolulu. Yeah, well. Yeah, they're trying to uh, anyways, I don't want to take say too yeah. much what they're trying to do, but um it's too much red tape. And you know, the founder of the Grassroot Institute would often say that the bigger the government gets, the smaller you get. And this definitely seems to be the case, even if it's in incremental stages. Um, you know, we already have a bill that um, manages short-term rentals. And so um, this is too much. Um, like I said, there's gonna be huge problems with backlogs at the planning department. Um, you've got homes on the Big Island that don't have proper permits, so that's a big problem. This gives more power to the county. Um, the county could do lot, deny lots of permits. Um, there's no guarantee that you can keep your permit, even if you do it. Let's say you do it properly the first year. Well, there's no guarantee that the second year that they're not going to um, deny it. And it's kind of unnecessary, too. We think this really won't bring down the price of homes. Um, now that's the theory. This is what the proponents of the bill say. We want to bring down the price of housing on the Big Island by somehow banning a bunch of short-term rentals. Well, this might actually be the opposite. If you think about it, um, the bill would require long, like all these, it would create all these long lines at the um, permitting departments, and that makes it harder to build housing. Um, we already have people who are trying to build good housing. Um, and get through the system as it is. That can. Yeah. Do has Grassroot done any uh, studies other than Hawaii about short term rentals taking up everybody else's housing? Making have, do you have any kind of data like that that we could you could share? We have data on that. We've looked at the studies. Um, we looked at the studies that um, that um, ascertain whether short term rentals increase the price of housing. Uh, and there's mixed. There's some studies say it does. Some studies say that it doesn't. Um, more studies say that it does increase somewhat the price of housing in a small way. But there's no studies that show that banning short-term rentals reduces the price of housing, um, especially in this case. Most of those studies, by the way, are talking about unhosted rentals. But on the Big Island, we have a bunch of hosted rentals. So. If you were to ban short-term rentals for hosted rentals, it's not like those houses would actually now start renting long-term. Uh, a lot of those homeowners may not wish to deal with long-term tenants and keep their homes empty um, or have their own solutions for using it. So um, it's not clear, and the people already live there. It's not like they're gonna rent to someone else automatically. So um, that's another point. Um, but yes, I can share those studies. So, um, okay, so let's move to the next slide here. So, and again, you know, we're only talking about the sliver. If, if um, you know, let's say we were to ban the short term rentals, um, keep in mind we're not banning luxury rentals, we're banning the, the affordable um, sort of rentals on the market side. We just don't think it would 
dent the market that much. So okay, you can move to the next slide. So if the county really did want to bring down the price of housing, there's so much that county lawmakers can do. Um, especially in Hawaii County, we probably have you know more leeway to affect the price of housing than any other county in the nation, actually, because we have the most restrictive housing regulations in the nation here at this county. Okay. Um, oh yes, I'll show you that. And so if you look um, on, as a percentage, or this is state level zoning, um, at the state level, um, only 2% of Hawaii Island is zoned for urban housing. Urban housing is the, that kind of housing that um, allows neighborhoods or single family, you know, a neighborhood of single family homes or something. Um, that's urban housing. We're not talking about Honolulu, you know, we're talking about Hilo. Uh, that's urban housing. And now that 2% figure though, is that you cut that in half because half of that is industrial zones like airports and harbors and stuff. And the other half might be housing. So actually it's around 1% of the whole highland is housing. And okay, let's look at that 1%. Oh, you can move to the next slide for it. Um, oh. Ready? Oh, oh, okay, this is, then you can just keep collecting here. This okay. is just talking about the need for housing and keep going. So, um, like I said, if you were to catalog all of the regulations and compare it by state by state, Hawaii is almost off the charts. We're at we're way, way, we have way, way more regulations for housing than any other state. You, know, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is the county level comparison. And Hawaii County has by far the most regulations of any uh, county in the nation. And so, again, if lawmakers wanted, really wanted to reduce the price of housing, there's so much that they could do, so many opportunities here. Um, okay, let's keep going. So we've done, we've studied this. We looked at the regulations by state and put it on a chart uh, and, and looked at the price. And what we find is the higher the regulations, then the higher the price. And the lower the regulations, the lower the price. And so this is sort of a clear trend, sorry, a clear trend that we see here. Um, so the answer is clear, reduce the regulations to allow for more housing. Um, okay. So, but there's a few other zoning reports that we can talk about. Uh, first is the Tokyo model. Look to Tokyo is what we say you can click. Um, so Tokyo had restrictive housing regulations and it um, reduced those. And for the last 20 years, the price of uh, a home in Tokyo has been exactly the same. It hasn't gone up at all. Um, and it's been very affordable to, um, to find housing there. Um, you could also allow more multifamily housing. And, but yeah, let's go to the next one. Remember I was talking about zonings. Well, this is Hilo. On the, is that left here? Um, you've got all these blue areas are where, that's urban housing. And that's where single family homes are. So, um, so we're talking about one house on 7,500 uh, 7, square feet of land. Um, over here, this is where multifamily homes are allowed. So you can see it's just a sliver. You can barely even see it here. That's where the multifamily homes are allowed. So we're talking about duplexes, or plexes, excuse me. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about rezoning all of Hilo to uh, allow for multifamily housing because that would be you know, a significant change. But we could. Um, there are certain neighborhoods where maybe the homeowner wants to add a house in their backyard or add a kitchen or something. I mean, really, we're talking about kitchens here, um, if you think about it. Um, a lot of the zoning regulations have to do with, with how many kitchens you have, actually. And so adding a, um, a part to your home with a kitchen that someone can stay in, uh, maybe that would be an attractive thing for the homeowner to do. They don't have to, if they don't want to, they don't have to. Um, but allowing for that would allow for more homes and it might increase the value of it as well. 
So, okay, and we can keep going. Other solutions that we're talking about are, yeah, you can keep going here. Smaller lots, you know, if you want to um, have a lot that's not 7,500 acre uh, square feet, but smaller than that, you should be able to do that. Uh, mixed use development, so um, businesses or you, there's a lot of um, old businesses that might be empty that you could put housing in, actually, you know, an old mall or something. Um, you could put housing there except for the zoning code is still up there. So um, that's a really easy one to do. Cut parking meadows. Not everyone wants or needs a parking space. Um, so that's something that you could do. Adaptive reuse, that's what I talked about before with this mixed use development. And buy right. Buy right is the most significant thing I think that uh, county lawmakers could do is adding more buy rights and housing. That means that instead of needing um, to go through the public hearing process for every post development, um, certain developments like affordable housing developments, for example, could just be approved by right, and you don't have to have all of the NIMBYs come out, and people who say not in my backyard, right? Um, and this has been shown to work in other areas, so. Okay, so that's housing, and I can answer questions, more questions about that. Um, and now I wanna talk a little bit about cesspools. So I told you that Cesspools, um, you know, are a big issue here. Um, I don't want to get too much into the environmental aspect of that. Let's just say that um, it is a big problem and assume that the cesspools are uh, polluting the oceans and all of that. That's a big problem. But so what's the solution to that? Well, in economics, there really are no such thing as solutions. And at Grassroot Institute, we don't really even say the word solution when we're talking to lawmakers or right? so things like that, because there are no solutions. There's only trade-offs. And we have to think about who it affects and what, what are other factors related to them. Um, is it really worth displacing all of the people who can't afford to upgrade their, um, their SAS pool so that you know, to achieve this goal? Or is there some sort of middle ground approach that might work? Um, these are questions that need to be asked. So um, we can move to the next one. Now, replacing a cesspool isn't cheap. These are the cesspools, and, and uh, of course, most of them are on the big island, as I showed before. Um, it's gonna, uh, these are the priority areas for cesspools. And you can see that uh, the, in yellow, these are the least priority. Um, to for replacement, the red and orange are the sort of priority area for replacement. And the thing that I noticed about this chart is um, that you know we've got a few areas here that seem to have a, a big need for successful replacements or some other solution. Now, what else could we do? Well, um, you know, there's like I said, trade-offs. You could. Um, but yeah, go back. Let's go back a slide here. You could install a wastewater treatment plant, for example, and allow the houses to hook up to that plant, which would significantly reduce the cost of every single person replacing their cesspool. Um, and of course, that would be a cost that the county would bear or the state might bear, but the county and the state say they don't have money. Now, the secret is they do have money. They have lots and lots of money, especially now. Uh, the county, uh, Hawaii County has a hundred and what is it, 160 million dollars windfall uh, this year that just came out of the blue. Um, every county is experiencing these huge windfalls. Um, so they have a bunch of bonus cash to play with. They're trying to use that cash to hire more bureaucrats right now um, but you know a lot of the money could be used for infrastructure upgrades like a wastewater treatment plant or something like that um the state 2.6 billion dollars this year the biggest surplus in the history of the state and they're even projecting that it's going to grow to 10 billion dollars in just four years um that's if there's a recession like they, they've projected that there might be a recession. 
and they still are seeing these huge booming surpluses. So what are they spending the money on? Well, a lot of that money is going towards um, pet projects. You've got the Aloha Stadium, which is getting uh, you know some untold hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, you've got uh, just a lot of different projects like that, and um, and what we're not addressing are the boring issues that are supposedly the core functions of government, which are you know, things like infrastructure. Uh, instead, we're putting that cost onto homeowners to you know, say, hey, you have to upgrade your cesspools. Well, the problem is it costs, what, between $10,000, $40,000 to upgrade your cesspool, and that cost is just uh, un, uh, unfeasible for most Hawaii County residents, most residents across the state. Um, so, so we have to think about costs and benefits. Is it really worth upturning all of this housing in yellow um, for that goal, or is there some other solution? Now, another way to think about this too is that the county um, or state may not have to um, run it. It could be run by a private company too. I mean, we've got private water systems. Um, the problem is there's this law called the Kona decision, um, which makes it illegal to privatize. Uh, I think Hawaii is the only state that has that law. Uh, basically, it says that if the government wants to privatize something that was typically done by that government, it's illegal. And you have to go to the legislature and pass you know, uh, a specific law to privatize. Let's say you wanted to build like a private wastewater treatment plant or something. You would have to go to the state legislature to ask them if you, the county, could privatize. And they might be at the state legislature, do they really care about that issue? Probably not. So um, so that is a Herculean task, um, except there's a loophole in that law that allows you to privatize if the function hasn't been historically typically done at, by the government. And so on Hawaii County, wastewater treatment plants haven't in a widespread way even been provided by the government. And so you could argue that this um, could go through that loophole and you could just um, hire private companies to do this. That's what they did in Honolulu, by the way. Um, they have a private water reclamation facility and they didn't have to um, go through the code of decision. They could do it that way because it was a service that was that was not typically provided. Yeah. Is it something different that like, the hotels all have their own private? Sewer systems. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. That you know, they've got their own private things. And so that sets a precedent, even that the county might not have to do that. So, okay, why think about private systems? Well, private systems um, are more sustainable financially. So, um, you know, in, in, a, in a public system, the incentive is to get as much money from the taxpayers as possible and to spend as little of it as possible on the system, right? Um, the, on the flip side, on a private system, the incentive is to get as little money as possible from the customers, less you're, you have a competitor to do that, and to spend as much of it on upgrades and long-term maintenance of the system. And so we, we find you know, in several studies that private utility systems function much better than public ones. And it's not far out of field. I mean, I visited Sandy Springs, Georgia, which is a city of 100,000 people. Um, they have a government that's run entirely by a private company. So, you know, the water, the sewers, the traffic, the parks, emergency services, all run by a private company, an engineering firm called CH2 on Hill. And they, um, there are nine city workers, which are the nine council members, and every year they vote whether or not to keep the company. And if the company does a bad job, they vote no, and they get a different company who might be able to do it better, faster, and cheaper. Um, even Hawaii County, you know, uses private contractors. You know, so, so private contractors and solutions are not too far afield, but it does take some creative thinking. So. Um, now, there's a lot more that I could talk about here. I don't want to walk out too much, 
but um, there are a lot of solutions to short-term rentals and housing and cesspools and many other issues. You can think out of the box a little, and that's what the Grassroot Institute is trying to do. Um, we don't care if an idea is you know, not politically feasible or a taboo to talk about. We look at all ideas because we have to like start sharing these ideas with people who might disagree with us because you can get a lot done and work together with people who disagree with you, actually. And that's what we're doing at the legislature. We work with, um, like I said, all stripes on these types of issues. And uh, we want to work with you too. So if you'd like to fill out your comment card, um, I'd like to you know understand how I did it and get your information. We can hopefully put you on our newsletter list if you're not on that already. So, okay, thanks so much. That's my talk. Yeah. I just wanted to add that where I was born and raised in a uh, town in Northern California called Humboldt County, they did a um, water treatment that was has been world. Oh, people all over to come and take a look at it. It's right on the head. You see? The Arcade March. Arcade March. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very interesting. It's, yeah. And, um, it's right on the water. They made a park out of it with the lock. It sounds crazy. It worked beautifully. Great, great. Oh, you know what? I forgot one more thing. Even Hawaii County thinks that it should privatize its wastewater. By the way, uh, go to the next slide. I totally forgot about this. So this was the findings of the Hawaii County Cost of Government Commission just uh, two months ago. And they said, our committee recommends that our county look to examples elsewhere in our state as Kono, like I said, has a loophole that allows leeway if the focus is not on customary and historic services. Honolulu did a 12 million gallons per day water recycling facility in EVA as water recycling was not a historic service. The facility was built with no taxpayer dollars stood apart from the nearby Honolulu wastewater treatment plant and impacted no union jobs. So I can go to the next one. Is um, that just spin that you call it a water recycling facility as opposed to wastewater? No, I think it is It is actually different. Really just, yeah, it okay. is a different thing, uh, but it's just an example of practice. Do you know to R2 or R1 standards? Oh, I don't know that. I'm not sure about that. Um, that. That report might have that, by the way. Mayor Roth has been approached by a couple of wastewater companies with very large portfolios willing to invest in solutions for Hawaii County. We should find a way to say yes while operating within the current confines of Kono. So, um, so even Hawaii County, um, you know, at least their commission center, so we gave them a pat on the back when they did that. So, yeah. um, so there you go. There are solutions out there. So who's on our wastewater committee? <laughs> Joe, when you say you work with them, even if they disagree with you or whatever, I mean, how, how do you do that? Because, I mean, my experience listening to the pro law, for example, and her, her strategy is just to throw the worst case scenario out, you know, to kind of like, this is my words, to, to kind of freak you out about anything, climate change to wastewater, to everything and so the baby wipe like, the baby wipes now that she yes. put the man on and what do you have and so her, her goal is to throw whatever she can at the wall and freak everyone out and just if she knows she's not going to get all of that so she goes all the way to one extreme knowing that she's going to have to settle for something that's less mm -hmm. and it's hard to in my opinion work with someone that has that mindset because Nobody, everyone, I think, would say none of us want to pollute our waters. So the question is, are we polluting our waters? Which are it's all right? What are reasonable, like you were saying, what are the reasonable ways to, the, what'd you say, not solutions, but uh, trade off? Trade -off, trade -off yeah. you know, how do you do that? Yes. Okay, so um, our theory of change works like this. Uh, there was someone who came up with this concept called the over to it. And the Overton window is the window of political possibilities. Basically, whatever's inside the Overton window uh, is politically possible. So if a lawmaker introduces a bill or says something about it, that policy we view as inside the Overton window. 
There's other issues that are outside the invertible window that are just have a long shot or will seemingly never pass. Um, and, but there's a secret about this window is that you can move the window. You can shift it left or right or up or down depending on how you pull on it. So how do you pull on the window? Well, one way is to talk about things that are um, slightly inside and grow your influence and authority with those legislators. Another way is to talk about issues that are way, way, way outside. And the lawmaker says, well, we can't do that, but we can do this. And now you've shifted the window slightly. Um, another way is to gather 30,000 or 40,000 or 100,000 people across the state to join your email list and tell that to lawmakers, which is exactly what we're trying to do. So we have an email list of uh, 35,000 now um, folks who read our stuff. There's a, a very high open rate of uh, around 40% every single week. And we talk about these issues. We even uh, mine that, those lists for people who are highly aligned with our, um, our mission and vision and values who can themselves talk to lawmakers because we don't always want it to just be us. And, um, and, and so we also have um, you know, a voter voice program where we ask all of our members to testify on things. And this year we've actually submitted um, a thousand, over a thousand testimonials so far this year. Um, and we're gonna keep on spamming them basically with our messages. The lawmakers told us, hey, Grassroot, we used to be able to ignore you, but uh, well, we can't ignore you anymore, <laughs> you know, because uh, we're showing up at their offices every day. We have a lobbying team with, you know, professional lobbyists and so on. And, and the lawmakers um, don't really know what to think about us. They often ask, like, well, who funds you? What special interest are you for? We're not a special interest. Actually, we're just, a, we're, we're advocates for liberty. And so our donors don't really, um, you know, sometimes people try to um, donate to us and say, hey, I'll donate, donate to you if you support this bill. And we, we don't make money, you know, that's not our thing. So, um, so lawmakers sort of respect us for that. And it's just all about, it's on a top home, building relationships and working together. Yeah, wasn't the USDA funding model? Um, we had that done here in Toronto several people called on the phone where USDA um, did the loan for it and then it was um, funded over 30 years where the homeowners would be able to make a payment to their sewer system? Well, that's an option. I mean, you could, or you could load a bond and do the same thing and, and give everyone sort of a special assessment fee in that area that's that's charged with it. I mean, that's absolutely an option that you could do. And it would probably be better than, um, you know, forcing every single homeowner to pay $40,000 or something. Instead, you pay 100, 100 bucks, you know, for a few years and, and that's it. The thing about the conversion window, um, you know, successful is some of these homes I can get. I don't even know how we would get, get to it. No, no. We had to bring out help. Right, and, and a lot of the homes are very old, and you basically have to replace the hole almost. Uh, you, know, you, you have to like replace the hole and get under there, and yeah. Yeah, any other comments? But you guys do anything with the, Joe and I talked about the school system before the meeting, but I mean, the average age of a school girl in here is 72 years old, 20% or over 100 years old, and a little lower school is paying that line recently. And you sent a, I sent a nice email to Nicole Bowen, and they're standing to reply back and you know, read my response in the newsletter that I sent to you. And you probably didn't read the bill, you just read some news article that was correct, which wasn't true. I read the bill. So, I mean, <laughs> I guess are you do you back with you well, for those kind of things too because yeah. that's a real problem yeah. staring in the face where the successful issue seems I understand the big picture of it, but it's a that seems like a much easier problem to solve for facilities and things like that. But it's oh I know. Um I just saw an article recently about a school on the Big Island that 
um, had so much bull that it was you know making mm. the kids sick. That's a little. That's the one. Now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah it's just a, yeah. Um, the state has huge a huge backlog for deferred maintenance. I mean, if you look at all the schools and the colleges and the airports and the harbors and all of the outdated, I mean, I saw buildings in the harbor, huge warehouses that um, somebody could use. But they're just sitting empty because they can't replace it. You know, the deferred maintenance. There's no money for the deferred maintenance cost. Um, and we we went and calculated all of the deferred maintenance across the state at the county level, the state level. We tallied up the debt, the unfunded liabilities for public pensions and health benefits for public workers. We looked at the bonds that are outstanding. We totaled it all up, and it's about hundred billion dollars when we look at the debt and unfunded liabilities and deferred maintenance because deferred maintenance is an unfunded liability right? it's a liability that you're that's on the books you have to pay for it sometime right and this is why we need to get our finances in order um, at the state level um you know our state is our state government is growing the spending is growing faster than the economy so if you look at the golden rule of government spending. Don't spend more than the private sector, right? Because the government gets the money from the private sector. But once the government spends more than the private sector, now um, you have a government that's outsized for the, the money that it takes in. And that's exactly what's going on in Hawaii. So, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but it's it really goes back to the principle of good budgeting. Keep spending low. Keep your debts low, pay off on kind of liabilities, pay down deferred maintenance. Don't spend on big boondoggle projects or shiny new ball projects. Um, and you know, we just have to keep on hitting that message, but it's a tough one. Can you share with us um, of, of the legislation that's still alive? What um what bills are you following regarding uh transient accommodations and housing, and then what bills regarding wastewater? Uh, well, with the transient accommodations, those often are at the county level. level. So- um, How about I, Bill 84? Is that the uh, the state level short-term rental mm -hmm. one? Yeah, we've been looking at that one a little bit. Um, I, I think that one would, in a way, ban short-term rentals at sort of a statewide um, regime. It gives the county the ability to oh, eliminate. Right. Yeah, that's right. So I, I believe we testified against that one. Um, for housing, uh, we're trying to look at that. It, it's difficult at the state level to talk about housing because it's really a county issue in a sense, uh, unless you're talking about the Land Use Commission. And so we did um, you know, testify on bills that would allow the Land Use Commission, you know, put a shot clock on the land use commission process to make it quicker, basically, um, and allow, make it easier to open up more land to urban zoning and things like that. So those bills are still alive right now. Um, and the other thing that we're looking at is healthcare. Um, you know, my dad said, Joe, you're studying stuff. Um, why don't you study why it's so difficult to get a doctor on the big island? <laughs> And I went down that road and I looked and it goes back to the government again. We have, we're, the, we're one of two states that taxes healthcare in the nation. We're the only state that taxes Medicare and TRICARE. Um, and, you know, our taxes are very high in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii has among the lowest Medicaid, uh, Medicare reimbursement rates in the nation. And so you add up all that together, and then it pushes doctors in the red and they close their shops or they move away or they don't open shops. And that's really the trend that has happened on the Big Island. Um, we're, we've got a bill that would exempt doctors from that tax. And so they wouldn't have to pay that. And um, it's still moving forward. Um, so we're cheerleading for it. So we'll see. Uh, yeah, there's a few. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, landlord tenant code. Is there anything 
I guess in the works on looking at that, I mean, that's been cited a lot of times as the reason why people don't do long-term rentals because there's so many protections for the, the tenants. Uh, are you guys doing anything? On no, that? that's a great point. No, I, I'd like to learn more about that, but that's a really good point. If you've got tenants that are so difficult to get rid of, you know, if they're a nuisance or something, then of course, why would you ever want to do that? And that incentivizes more church and rentals instead. So it's a great point though. So besides donating money to your cause, like what can you, like as a group of parents, we want to go after the education system and some of them, we feel like there's just this David against the Goliath and how do we, how do we even start and, and how do we know who to team up with and are there other people around the state? I think there are, but I mean, how do you know, I guess how does the average person Try to figure out one about whether it's accessible or education or healthcare. How do you even, other than I mean, you can write your legislature, but I get a standard answer back. Yeah. Do I just keep writing to them? You know, to them. And do I show up at their offices? Do I take it outside their house? And like, what do I do to get the attention to say, well, you, you know, how do we? Because we need to work with you. It's not an attack. At them, but, yeah. but you want to start the attacking because not physically, no, I that, yeah. But you know, I mean, you, you want to kind of just because they're not listening and they're not willing to because, oh, he's just some crazy guy or whatever. And I've got other things I got to do that are shiny. I don't even know. Real fast, it sounds a lot better. I'm um, so resonated mm -hmm. putting that towards a school or subject system, yeah, yeah. It, um, Again, we're not, grassroots isn't the solution, of course. Uh, we are not the, um, you know, hero in the story. We view the individuals as the hero. We're the guy in the story. Um, why is it called the Grassroot Institute and not the Grassroots Institute? It's because Dick Rowland, the founder of the Grassroot Institute, was interested in the individual and the individual's power to influence society. And so he wanted grassroots to be a guide for all individuals across the state on many different issues. So, um, you know, we're hoping that folks can read our materials and get involved. Uh, we have a group, like I said, of sort of the um, cream of the crop um, individuals who really wanted to um, influence lawmakers, but we call it the grassroots Ohana. And um, we put those folks in touch with those lawmakers, the key lawmakers, who are the heads of the committees, um, so that folks aren't wasting their time talking to someone who's you know, not really that influential or something. So, um, and we always find that lawmakers would much rather talk to folks like you rather than folks like me, um, because you're the constituent and, um, and you have much more power than we have, actually. So. Just, you know, um, I don't know if when you came over here from, and if you're aware that this group um, got $50,000 from the NAR grant to um, go up against the um, TAR bill here. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Okay. So, so this group that you're talking to here is super, super educated oh, okay. and um, have been at battle. And okay. We've, we've, we've looked at several of your articles. It's been very informative okay. and good. So I don't know if there's a way for us to work together. Yeah. If you guys got a loud voice. Um, we're with the Hawaii Association of Realtors, the largest trade organization in the state, with 11,000 members. So we've okay. been um, we've been pretty effective, and locally, we're the largest um, trade organization in Hawaii County with the two boards together. So and that's about 1,500 um, active members there. So we're doing a lot with that, and I think um, I think with HAR's help us. Last year, we effectively built a set for the bill. We're really deeply involved with everything that you talk about here, and I just don't know if there's ways for us to even work together more to um, have a stronger voice publicly to help. Because this fifty thousand dollars that you guys got was to um, educate the uh, homeowners okay. uh, on on the, what was going to be taken away from property rights, things like that. So yeah, I mean, just me coming here is is huge. Like, yeah. um, you know, now I can. Share the cesspool issue and the short-term rent, the local short-term rental issue with our folks at our office. You know, I had to study all this stuff to try to present today. Okay? So, and I would like to learn more from you about what I can bring back to our office. I mean, we've got a team of wonks 
uh, with calculators and pens that are ready to nerd out on these things. Um, and so, yeah, you know, all these different ideas, just keep them coming our way. We get slogged though. I mean, you know, there's a million different issues in the state and we're trying to focus on those that we can actually influence. Um, but if we don't respond, just, you know, keep sending an email or something, we'll get into it. Chuck Reed is out right now and we're waiting on the draft order and um it's somewhat imminent that it will be in the loose and at uh to the council. Oh okay. And then at that point it will be um say, critically critical to to um have to talk to ourselves. Yeah, that's a good point. Um I'll uh look for that. Yeah, let's and, I, and we have a few contacts on the big island, not as many as we'd like, but yeah. We can help you with that. Okay, good, yeah. Yeah, just get our stuff out there. You know, it's free to sign up um, and people, you know, write us back all the time with their opinions and we try to respond to every single one. Um, so yeah, it's about working together. There is a few questions in the chat. Okay. One of them was really early on, so I'm not really sure where it was. Um, in the presentation, but it says, are you able to identify increase due to some aspect of better accounting or is it a real increase? Oh, um, she's talking about inflation perhaps. Um, uh, well, we have hot inflation right now. And that's, so, so why do we have these big surplus revenues, right? It's partly because of inflation. When inflation goes up, who are the winners and losers? The winners are the government because they get so much more money. You know, if the inflation goes up five to nine, eight percent, then revenues go up eight percent, right? Um, and so they get the money first. And then and the people that lose are the citizens at the grocery store who have to pay more for everything. Um, so oh, the, the that question, it, it was the dollar spent from STVR guests. Oh, that yeah. one? Oh, uh, whether that's real? That's the same one I think I asked where the data came from. Or something oh, yeah. Like okay, that. there you go. That came from that study. Yeah, the cloning or the SIM study. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, if we can get a copy of that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I'll send that your way. And then the next question, is the housing fund still available? And if so, can that possibly offer a partial subsidy to homeowners who are proactive measure to replace their cesspools before 2034? Or is it a possibility of a tax credit and as an incentive to replace prior to the force deadline? Uh, yeah, so a tax, tax, tax credit is a good idea, um, but um, I don't know if it's enough. The housing fund, I think someone just put in $5 million into that. $5 million, I mean, this is a $3 billion problem. So $5 million isn't really gonna go as far as the lawmakers think it will. Um, so we need bigger ideas, I think, than just money will solve it. What was that five million? Uh, they they start they they created a fund to help um, give you know money to folks who are proactively replacing their cesspools. Well, um, and it's first come first serve. So I just, it's, I dug into that just for your own information. So that 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 money has to be encumbered by July of next year. Oh. and it was it started July of last year. Yeah. They haven't figured out how to even disperse the right. money yet because we're not a penny been given out. It, it equates to 250 homes um, statewide and 1.8 million of it's going to be earmarked for the Big Island, which would be 90 homes that it would tell out of um, six, uh, 50, 6,100. So it's now 90 homes. And like I said, that money has to be encumbered in July of next year. Wow. And they need to get it out. <laughs> Pretty scary. You probably have 90 in one second, but you yeah. 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 Okay, well, I don't want to. Uh, These are all the questions yeah. out of the chat, so. I don't want to go too long if that's, uh, I don't want to keep you here. If, uh... No, I appreciate you coming over and, and doing this. Thank you. Good, thank you. And thanks for inviting me. It's pretty much. I, I have data too for you because I, I looked up all the data on um, um, the amount of homes became available after 2108. Mm -hmm. And the pricing of what happened, and okay. the pricing was up. It didn't help, and home um, availability was down. The number of homes for sale dropped after the building went away from the fact. So, um, oh, there's there is physical proof for you guys to. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I love that data. 
Very good. Yeah. Okay. If Bill 108 didn't do it, right? Well, how was TAR? That's right. Mm -hmm. And they always say that, oh, this is the last bill, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Will we be able to get a copy of the presentation? Yeah, I can send that to you, folks. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah,